What's going on, everybody? It's me, Ryan, the host of the Classic Buffalo Podcast, the podcast that aims to lessen depression, anxiety, mental health, make you feel a little bit better by sharing everyday people's stories. And today is no different. It is another episode that is of quality. I promise. Uh, or money back. You know, obviously, we're, we're all about customer service here <laughs> at Classic Buffalo. But uh, yeah, we're interviewing a friend of mine. I went to college with her, uh, and she has a really cool uh, intertwining of uh, my story and her story for a little bit of time. She, uh, we're catching her kind of more recently as far as what her story is and kind of what happened after. Uh, she left Taylor University, the university that I went to and graduated from. So that's what kind of most of the story is about. But we talk a lot about our friendship. We talk about her relationship issues and uh, how she's dealt with things and um, how mental health plays into what she's trying to do and ultimately her journey to become a very successful and awesome actress. So, And honestly, we talk a little bit about the COVID-19 thing and how that's directly hit home with her. So it's a beautiful episode. It's a, you know, jam-packed full of content. And without further ado, let's get into today's episode with Becca Hayes. Joining me via, are you in Cincinnati? I totally forgot. Where are you at? (laughs) I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. What? How did? Oh, wow. So that must have been a very new and recent thing. Becca yeah. Hayes is joining me, which I thought she was in Cincinnati, but now <laughs> she's Carmen San Diego in Atlanta, Georgia. Welcome to the Class of Buffalo podcast, Becca. What up? You've been kind of a part of this since like 2015. Oh, yeah. Kind of, yeah. We met in a really funny way. Oh, pff, I don't even remember how we met, to be really? honest. Yeah, no. That used to be like a huge meme or joke was, uh, so there was, oh, God, what were their names? My, my Wait, Asher and Lorenzo? Yeah. That okay. Was, they were like, go up to her and just say, what are those? That back when that was a thing. Oh! It really is. And then you were, you were like, that's not funny. Or just something like, and I just was totally really bad reaction. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> like, it was just something. Yo, I totally forgot about that. I remember you messaged me later and you're like, I didn't mean to offend you. And I was <laughs> Bro, back in the day, like back in freshman year of, of college, I was the most blunt, the most honest. Uh-huh. I still am, but I've like learned to like tone it down when I'm meeting new people that it's like they don't know that. So like I have to like make sure that I'm presenting myself in such a way that doesn't come off as like an asshole. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, you've always been unapologetic with yourself. That's one of the favorite parts about you. So, but we'll get into that. Um, what I want to do is uh, we're going to start out. A little bit of an icebreaker for people to get to know you, for me to ask you random questions I never got to ask you while we were at college together. Number one, what does your favorite shirt look like? It's a Virgil Blow shirt. If you don't know who Virgil yeah. Blow is. Okay. Well, for people that don't know, yeah. the creator of Off-White. I went to the exhibit in, um, in Atlanta. It's called the High Museum. And I went to his exhibit and like his, like all of his fashion was there, like every shoe that he made was there like a bunch of stuff that like he's created was there and then at the end they had a gift shop like a bunch of the stuff in the gift shop was like four thousand dollars i was like oh my my gosh like i can't get anything and then he was like selling his t-shirts for like 25 dollars i think so no i wish are you kidding me oh my gosh it'd be amazing to meet him it's like a macaroni and cheese yellow a motorcycle on the front and then I forget what's on the back but then it you know like says his name and like when it was created and like established when and like all that stuff it's like yeah. my, probably my favorite shirt and I got it oversized so I could wear it like a dress <laughs> there you go what do you uh like why is it your favorite shirt it's a representation of my creativity and a representation of my love for art in any form because that's something that Virgil stands for completely in the sense that you know like he pulls a lot of like his inspiration from old art but then as well from like film and from like music and not just standing from like photo perspective I don't know if that's the right term but to wear that shirt it's like yes I'm an actress but at the same time like I love music and I love uh art and I love so many other things I think that philosophy and politics and religion are all really like important to like this day and age number two what is your most used emoji or emojis right now my most used emoji by far is the laughing emoji, for sure. 
crying like normal one or like sideways where they're like tilted? Nah, the normal one. Okay. The tilted one is too much. You extra if you use it all the yeah. time. <laughs> Damn, I'm extra. Okay. Yeah, I just sure. started using it. Yeah. If you could go to dinner with anyone in the world, who would you go with or have to be alive? Donald Glover. Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah. Why? I want to understand his process of thinking because he started in the music industry. And even when he started, like the music that he created was just so deep and like there were so many layers. And then after that, he was like, okay, I'm done with music, which was a lie because he posted more music. So, <laughs> right. yeah, yes. but then he made Atlanta, the creativity within that. And it was just like, whoa, like, because for me, you know, I have many different passions. I love to dance. I love to sing. I love to act. Um, but then I also, you know, I love to learn language and I love to learn more about politics and, and have those discussions and understanding how to be quick witted and have a response to everything. Like, you know how right now, like, as I'm talking, like I have to take a pause to oh. formulate my next sentence. Like he yeah. just knows, like yeah. he's on his game, like 24 seven. And I went to his concert um, at Lollapalooza and like just the visuals at Lollapalooza was just like, wow, that's amazing. And so I would love to just talk to him and have dinner with him and just be like, let me into your mind for a second. How, what does it look like? Uh -huh. So, yeah. Is he from Atlanta? Is that why he made that? Oh, you tested my knowledge. I don't know, actually. Okay. Uh, I'm sure he just has passion for Atlanta. I know. I just, I loved Atlanta. The, uh, the one where the episode that he did with, uh, that really creepy guy, where did they get, sorry, I don't, this is probably spoiling it too much, but I, I love when in cinematography or in general, where they're like, they have the director explain why they did certain choices with the coloring, with the music, like there's all these different things like, oh my gosh, they were so smart. And you, like, if you just watch it, it might be like, oh, that was funny or that's cool or that's, that was dramatic. But like, then when you see the director go by and say like this is why we did intentional with all of these different things go and rewatch it you're like oh my god it's such a magic masterpiece right yeah. i am um, i just looked it up because i had to know he's yeah. from california <laughs> oh okay well yeah hey shout out to atlanta i guess yeah what are your thoughts have you listened to his new album i have not the full thing but it's definitely a different sound it doesn't bump the same way that like summertime magic or like feels like summer does or even like heart, Heartbeat or Bonfire or something like that. But I mean, it's definitely like a vibe. I like it. You're right on the ball. I was going to ask you, where would you go to eat? I don't know. I'm feeling like Italian. Okay. You want to go to Olive Garden or you want to go to like a mom and pop Italian place? Nah, like, you know, I, I'm i I'm po right now. I'm very poor right now. But like, once I'm up there, I'm sure I'll know what Italian places are popping. And then yeah. we'll go there. What is your motto or piece of advice that you've received recently or always lived by do you think it's really helpful or cool it's always one foot right in front of the other right like w especially when you're going through hard times like don't forget to just breathe and just keep going because you know you get huge tunnel vision when you're going through something really hard and you're like wow like nobody else is going through this mm -hmm. and I don't see a way through it and so I might as well just give up but if you don't give up and you just keep putting one foot right in front of the other, you'll realize that there are other people around you that are going through the same exact thing and you're not alone and a mountain that you have to climb. But once you make it, wow, take a pause to mm. formulate my next sentence. Like he yeah. just knows, like yeah. he's on his game like 24 seven. And I went to his concert um, at Lollapalooza and like just the visuals at Lollapalooza was just like, wow. That's amazing. And so I would love to just talk to him and have dinner with him and just be like, let me into your mind for a second. How, what does it look like? Uh -huh. So, yeah. Is he from Atlanta? Is that why he made that? Oh, you tested my knowledge. I don't know, actually. Okay. Uh, I'm sure he just has passion for Atlanta. I mm know. -hmm. Uh, I just, I loved Atlanta. The, uh, the one where the episode that he did with uh, that really creepy guy, where did they get, sorry, I don't, this is probably spoiling it too much, but. I, I love when in cinematography or in general where they're like, they have the director explain why they did certain choices with the coloring, with the music, like there's all these different things like, oh my gosh, they were so smart. And you, like, if you just watch it, it might be like, oh, that was funny or that's cool or that's, that was dramatic. But like, then when you see the director go by and say like, this is why we did intentional with all of these different things, 
go and rewatch it, you're like, oh my god, such a master masterpiece. Right. Yeah. I um I just looked it up because I had to know. He's yeah. from California. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, yeah. Hey, shout out to Atlanta, I guess. <laughs> yeah. What are your thoughts? Have you listened to his new album? I have not the full thing, but it's definitely a different sound. It doesn't bump the same way that like summertime magic or like feels like summer does or even like heart, heartbeat or bonfire or something like that. But I mean, it's definitely like a vibe. I like it. You're right on the ball. I was going to ask you, where would you go to eat? I don't know. I'm feeling like Italian. Okay. You want to go to Olive Garden or you want to go to like a mom and pop Italian place? No, nah, like, you know, I, I'm, I'm po right now. I'm very poor right now. But like, once I'm up there, I'm sure I'll know what Italian pa- places are popping, and then yeah. we'll go there. What is your motto or piece of advice that you've received recently or always lived by that you think is really helpful or cool? It's always one foot right in front of the other, right? Like, w- especially when you're going through hard times, like, don't forget to just breathe and just keep going because – you know, you get huge tunnel vision when you're going through something really hard and you're like, wow, like nobody else is going through this mm-hmm. and I don't see a way through it. And so I might as well just give up. But if you don't give up and you just keep putting one foot right in front of the other, you'll realize that there are other people around you that are going to th- through the same exact thing and you're not alone and a mountain that you have to climb. But once you make it, wow, it's worth it. You just have to remember that, like, it will be worth it in the end. Yeah, amidst everything that's been going on, the concept of time has been something of a blessing. You've heard everything from this is going to be over at the, in June and July to, like, 2021, June, July. Like, you've heard everything, right? Mm-hmm. In 18 months, where am I going to be? I'm going to be 27 still. Like, I'm still not 30, which I've, because for whatever reason, I've built up being 30 as, like, everything's downhill from there I have to have everything achieved by 30 but I'm like I'm still not 30 I've still got all these things I want to do like the concept of time and like patience and just working each day has been somewhat of like practice I guess like a, a little form of gratitude has like really helped in this time I feel like when I say one foot in front of the other it's not look into the future and see where you're gonna be because for instance, let me just tell you right now I'm shaking my head at you for thinking that 30 is like oh the end all be all yeah Right. And we live to like 80, 90, right? Yeah. So 30, like for a lot of people is their starting point. And that's perfectly fine. Like for people that are like, oh, when is this going to be over? This sucks. Like da, 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 da. Yeah. It sucks for everybody. Like you're being repetitive. You're a broken record at this point. You just need to like focus on the here and now. What can you do here and now? Yeah. You can't go meet with people. For us as actors, we can't create an ensemble together and work on group projects together but we can work on our own selves and write monologues and we can start deconstructing movies and like you can start writing your own work and starting making scripts for yourself like there's always something that you can be doing and you can always be doing more it really is all up to you at the end of the day you are your biggest like obstacle like don't be getting down on yourself just because like you aren't where you perceived yourself to be five years back well you are there now so what are you going to do about it number five the conspiracy theory that you actually believe. Do you remember the Berenstein Bears? Mm-hmm. How do you spell the Berenstein Bears? B e r e n s t e i n. Berenstein. All right, like, now look it up. Berenstein. What? Right. What is that? Oh my <laughs> gosh! So, so the Mandela, the Mandela effect, or whatever. The... Yeah. Okay. <laughs> End the call. This is ridiculous. I'm in the universe now. What's going on? Yo, that tripped me the hell out. I was like, yeah. bam, my life is a lie. I don't even know who these bears <laughs> are anymore. What do you <laughs> Sister, brother, bear, you have my back from the beginning type shit. Like, oh, God. Yeah. Uh, it's sort of like, well, I was going to compare it to potato salad. What? The reason why is like it's something you don't want to eat every day. It's something like you just you can think about, but you don't want to spend all of your time do, like – you could eat pizza every day, but it's not healthy to do that. It's like it conspiracy theories are like fun to talk about and to like think about, but like for you to just be always, always in conspiracy theories, like that's probably not as healthy. Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> potato salad, obviously. No, but like I love potato salad, so you can't use potato salad. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, you're like, I like potato salad. Like you could say like potato. zucchini bread or something. Mm, like that okay. is fire from time to you time. You like zucchini bread? I've never been a fan. Okay, you know what? We just can't relate. It's all right. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's just a vegetable that snuck into my cake. 
<laughs> it ain't even cake, it's bread. All right, whatever. All right, Becca, so get us to day one. You've emerged out of the womb. Where are you at? What's going on? What's the family dynamic like? Um, I am from Cincinnati, Ohio, born and raised. My mom is from Mexico City. My dad is from San Bernardino, California, and he's a ginger. So a ginger and a Mexican had me, um, as well as my two brothers. I am a middle child. My older brother, his name is Andrew, and he lives in Chicago. And he is a computer mm. science, uh, well, a computer scientist or like a computer programmer. He works with coding. Doing very well. He's 24 years old, about to turn 25 on the 26th of April. My younger brother is studying mechanical engineering at uh, Miami University in Oxford, which is about 40 minutes away from, my, from where I'm from. And he's 21 and he won't have a graduation ceremony thanks to this virus. Um, but yeah, that really sucks. My, actually, my whole family is very introverted and I'm very extroverted. I was always the one that was like trying to cuddle with people and trying to hug everybody and just like really loud and everybody was telling me to shut up and be quiet. And like, I never understood the sense or the idea of like personal space unless it came to myself, which is so weird. Like I loved being all over people, but I didn't like being touched. It was so, I don't, it makes no sense. Mm. To this day, it's still kind of like that, but because of the things that I've been through in life and realized like, the right. sense of personal space. Um, I'm not like always all up on people, but I've always been a very affectionate and loving and compassionate person. Because of my brothers, I was also always into gaming and I've always gotten along better with guys than I have girls because we always had guys over at the house. And anytime that I brought a girl over, I was always trying to like look cool because that's just like what I thought was right to do. And so I was always into like first person shooters like Halo and like Call of Duty. Uh, we got computers, and so then I got really into Toontown and, like, World of Warcraft. Uh -huh. There you go. League of Legends. So, like, even to this day, like, I still play League of Legends. Like, I love the game so much. And I've made a lot of friends because of it. My older brother was always extremely, like, against creating conversations with people because he is, in terms of, like, the Myers-Briggs test, I'm pretty sure he's INFJ, which stands for, like, introverted, intuitive, feeling, and judgmental. So. I'm ENFP, which is basically the complete opposite. <laughs> so our personalities never really meshed well growing up. And so we never really grew close to each other. Like even now, like, you know, like if I was in the hospital or something, like obviously he would be there, but we don't text every day. Like we don't really talk, but like we will always be there for each other on a sibling level. Same thing for my younger brother. Growing up, I never felt like I could be honest with my parents in the sense of having grown in a Christian home, we have these standards, we have these beliefs, we are told that we, like, if we are gay, that it is wrong, if we're, we're told that drinking is wrong, that smoking weed is wrong, and, like, God said this, therefore we do this, and so, you know, like, if I ended up, like, hooking up with a guy, like, I was too scared to, like, talk about how that made me feel, and I was um, never very open with my parents, so they knew me, like they knew a shell of who I was. They knew like my outer self, but they never knew my inner self. And I think leaving the home, going to college gave me a sense of self and gave me a sense of courage to be able to open up more to them. Everybody goes through like puberty. And like during that time, I really became very distant from both of my parents because like I felt like they were naive to the ways of the world. And to them, that's how it should be. You know, that was their belief system and still is their belief system that we are to live in the naiveness of a child because we have him at the center of our core. And as long as we have him driving and um, deciding everything that we think, say, and do, then we are living our best lives, basically. Um, and during that time period, I realized that my beliefs were not in alignment with their beliefs, because what I believe is the same in the sense that I do believe that our father, our creator, sent down his only son so that he may trade his perfect life for our imperfect ones so that we may live an eternal life with him. And without the three days later resurrection, the whole like, like faith basis is nothing. I also believe that gay marriage is good. I believe that smoking weed is perfectly fine. And I think drinking in like moderation is also fine. 
And those are just like the three top ones. There's like so much yeah, more right, to it, yeah. like being pro-choice versus being like pro-life and all that other stuff. But um, I remember like one day I came home, like I was really high and they never knew that like I had been smoking. How old were you at this point? I didn't start smoking oh, until okay. like the summer before college. I've never really been like a smoker. Like it's always been like a social thing for me. My dad was like, are you high? And I was like, yeah, why? Like, I just didn't care. I was like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. okay. And so he sits me down. He pulls out, like, I would say, like, 300 pages about why smoking weed is so bad oh, for your health. And, like, my mom and my dad sat across from me in our living room telling me how bad it is to like and how badly like smoking weed stunts your like growth in your brain and like all this stuff and you know they're reading it to me they're reading it to me and then they're, they're like what it, what are your thoughts on this and I said you have not presented me with any new information it actually offends me that you think that I would not do my own sense of research before going and dabbling in something that I've never done before and I do know the like things that like would harm me in a negative aspect, which is why I don't smoke like tobacco. That's why I don't use like backwoods. That's why I don't. Um, and you know, I start listing off like all the like things that I've done to make sure that I'm doing it in the best way possible. And I'm not using it as a coping mechanism. I'm using it as like a social tool. And I think that's perfectly fine. And if our views don't align, that's also perfectly fine. And you know, like I love debating. I love debating because um, not because I, like just proving people wrong as most people love debating. I love debating because I love being proven wrong and also learning a new perspective to take into my own and to learn new ideas to them. Like, especially my dad, like he always thinks he's right. And he's going to tell you why he thinks he's right. And if you think anything, otherwise it's just wrong, whether it's an opinion or a fact that was also really frustrating. So then after that, you know, I told them I wasn't going to come home like I, w- I wasn't going to smoke in the home. I wasn't going to like come home high, da, 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 da. like out of respect for them. Cause I'm living in their home. You know, if it's their rule, I'm going to respect that. Yeah. But then like I told them, like, if I'm out, if I'm out doing my own thing, if I'm like with my friends, whatever, you can't tell me what to do because like, I'm 20 years old now. I'm not, I'm not 17, 16, whatever. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Kindergarten to sophomore year of college. I went to a private school, private Christian school. I felt like, I was stuck in this box of people all believing the same thing. And if you did anything otherwise, you were wrong. For instance, when I was in college and I dyed my hair blue, somehow I was wrong for that. Or when I would just go hang out with guys, I was wrong for that. You know, all throughout high school, like because I was literally so naive, I wasn't even ignorant. I was just uneducated and naive to like other ways of life. I felt secluded from being a part of friend groups and things because everybody else came from public school and then transferred to like private school and they were like I hate it here because you can't do anything and I'm like it's not even that strict like so like four guys and me like we became this really close group of friends that did everything together and we were always there for each other and to this day we are still there for each other and they really like opened my eyes to other ways of thinking not the sense that like they wanted to divert my faith in any way but just to show me like hey you need to know that like black lives matter you need to know that like minorities also have a voice you need to know like that feminism is an okay thing to believe you like all these things that like I thought were controversial in my head and are controversial but that I need to be on the right side of those things. Mm, So I had no idea that they were even a problem. Like I remember back in high school when I was in English class and we had to write a report about something controversial and I chose abortion and I said that I was pro-life. And I remember distinctly writing about it because I knew that I would get an A if I said that I was pro-life. Not because I actually believed that I was pro-life. For me, I am pro-choice because it's up to the woman. It's not up to the baby. Like I was so incredibly unaware of the things going on in the world because I was told that I was supposed to turn a blind eye to it and just focus on my spiritual life with him. And my senior year of high school is like when my passion for YouTube peaked. 
and I really, really, really wanted to be a YouTuber, like more than anything in the world, because I was so obsessed with watching people on YouTube, watching everybody, how they edited on YouTube. And I was like, I can do this and I'm going to do it. I think I was a junior in high school. And then senior year, it started like, I started making more videos and I told my parents, I sat them down and I was like, Hey, I'm going to be a YouTuber right out of high school. That's what I'm going to do. This is my passion. I'm going to make it happen. My dad uh, went to Cornell University for his undergrad. Oh, boy. And then he went to Harvard to get his PhD in oh chemistry. Oh, my gosh. And then my mom came from Mexico City at 18 years old to the University of Notre Dame at the age oh. of 18 to get her undergrad. And then she got her uh, master's degree in chemistry from Cornell. Not doing college is not an option. So they forced me to, you know, look at colleges, try and figure out where I wanted to go. And I was like, what am I even going to major in? And so my mom gave me the idea of why don't you study film so that you can learn about lighting and cameras and equipment and editing. And I was like, okay, yeah, that sounds fair. Yeah. So we went around to look at colleges and I was really dead set on making it to LA as soon as possible. So we looked at colleges in California. We looked at like the Bible Institute of Los Angeles. We looked at um, Vanguard. We looked at Pepperdine. And then here, like in Ohio, we looked at Miami. We looked at Bowling Green. We looked at so many different colleges. And I really did not have a care in the world to go to college. So when I got all the acceptance letters back because I applied to all of them and I got into all of them. Of course you did. Well, I guess I'll go to Taylor because my parents seem to love Taylor the most. Mm. So it wasn't even that I yep. really cared for the school because I mean, I thought the campus was pretty and I thought the people seemed cool, but it was just more of a, oh, well, it's a Christian school. My parents like it. I think the campus is nice. So I'll go there. It was really nice to be surrounded by a community of people that love the Lord just as much as I did. But then upon being there and being there for, what was that, two years, sophomore year came along and I created a group of friends. It was uh, Miles Houston, Tori Pavlovsky, Jill Greenway, Adam Romick, Shelby Miller, and Josh Smith, and then me. So there were seven of us. And we were the best of friends. We would go to dinner together. We would have study group sessions together. Any time that like we weren't in class, we were together. One by one, each of them dropped out for a different reason. Miles was having trouble with the soccer team. And so he decided to transfer. Then Josh was like, I hate it here. And I really want to go somewhere else. And he transferred to Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design. And then Jill transferred to Kent State. And so yeah, then- so your whole support system's transferring away. Yeah. And it was literally just me, Tori, and Adam. So then Christmas break comes around. And during this time, Miles and I had realized that we liked each other. So then we decided to hang out together over Christmas break. Like a month prior to that, like we had been hanging out every single day, even more so than everybody else. We would like go to Taco Bell and we would like hang out at the theater. And like, that's when I found my passion for acting. And like, you know, like I got extremely sad knowing that he was going to transfer to Ashland University. Over Christmas break, we hung out. I hung out at his parents' house. And then, like, the next day, I went home. And then Christmas came around. And I'm telling him everything that I got for Christmas. And then he tells me, oh, by the way, I do like you. But I don't want to hurt you. And I feel like I need to grow more spiritually within myself before I can dedicate myself to you. So I'm cutting things off. And so that was, like, the first time I'd ever, like, gone through even a sense of like heartbreak but not even like real heartbreak because we weren't together we were never together we were never in love nothing like that so it was just like owie you know so (laughs) then we come back for j term and tori and adam took the month off oh so so you're there by yourself yeah so it's just me and it's a small school like we uh, the school we went to is about two thousand people so during j term where not a lot of people are there anyway. It's cold as balls on top yeah. of that. Yeah, it's like it's snowing and there's no one around. There's like 100 people on campus, maybe. Yep. Granted, like everyone knew who I was because like I was so like out there, yep. Yep. but I wasn't close friends with anybody that was there. So it was like, oh, hey, Becca, what's up? Like, how are you? And like, I'm like dying inside, but like on the outside, I'm like, 
decline, like, you know, so this is really where my like mental health declined, like for the first time in my life, because, you know, like all throughout high school and everything, like I never really had anything quote unquote bad happen to me, you know? So like, yeah, I was sad some days and like lonely sometimes, but I never experienced feeling so alone and so out of my comfort zone that I didn't know what to do to me. Like this is when I started having like anxiety and I never experienced anxiety before. So my sense of anxiety for me, it literally feels like someone has taken a sword and just like stuck it in my chest and just like left it there. And it stings so bad and like making it so hard to breathe that like, I just like get so exhausted and like, I don't know, like I'll walk to the DC, right? Is that what it was called? The dining yeah. Yeah, yeah. By the time I sit down, I'm like literally like breathing heavily because <laughs> it was like that exhausting. It wasn't that I was out of shape because I was still doing lacrosse. You know, I've never experienced this before. So like, how am I supposed to train my brain to tell me that I'm fine when I'm not? During that time, during the month of January, I started reading my Bible every single day and I was praying all the time and I was crying myself to sleep every single night. I'm still just trying to find a sense of self. And I really just like had to figure out how to be happy on my own. And, you know, second semester rolls around. Lacrosse was my safe haven. It was the way that I could just distract myself from everything else and just put all my effort into just like being a better version of myself in the game and like winning, you know, like I, I always want to win. I was always just like working out and then like practicing and then like uh, going to tournaments and like just always hanging out with my friend, Abby, who is also part of the lacrosse team. Thank God for Abby. We would literally, <laughs> sorry to you, but we would literally go to our car and just like take a bottle of Svedka and just like drink and just like <laughs> yell God. <laughs> because we were both like just going through it. And so going through second semester, with the mindset that I was leaving. And I kept telling people I'm transferring. Like I told Jay Johnson, hey, I'm leaving. And he's like, yeah, right, no, you'll be back. School turned really quickly into molasses for a lot of people. <laughs> you just kind of get stuck and you kind of like, oh, I guess I'll just graduate. I'm here third year, fourth year. Exactly. But I, I knew like I was not gonna survive if I stayed there because yeah. there's, it, it's surrounded by cornfields. There's nowhere to go. The only thing that you can do is like hang out with friends and do devotions and read your Bible and go to chapel. And like, it's right. so repetitive. Like, where is the excitement in life from that? You know, like, let me go cliff jumping once or twice. Oh wait, it's too cold to do that. You know, like <laughs> there's nothing around. So. Yeah. And ultimately for about 20 years now, you've been living in a box and it's like, yeah. what's over, what's over there? Like you kind of, it, it builds up and you got to go. Yeah, because, you know, I literally felt like I was in jail. I, I always made the joke that, like, the, my, this is a bad joke, but, you know, that my dorm room was, like, my jail cell, and, like, the campus was, the, like, the jail, like, premises. Just yeah. because, like, there was nowhere else to go. There was nothing to do. There was nothing to see. Nobody understood what I was going through. Nobody understood how lonely I felt, even though I was extremely popular there. On top of that, like, a lot of the girls didn't like me because of all the guys that I would hang around with. So they thought that I was a hoe. And it was, like... Yep. Right. I yeah. haven't even lost my virginity. Like, what do you mean? <laughs> and somebody that really helped me a lot was Aaron Boss. I totally forgot about this, but I remember one day I had just finished Spanish class and I talked to Klotz. He was helping me through a time in which I was talking about miles to him. Klotz was like, well, maybe he's a narcissist and you're just a codependent. And I didn't know anything about that. So I did a lot of research on that realized that was like completely true. I had just finished my conversation with him and I went into my car and I was just like, so sad, you know, like I'm literally just like in my car sulking and I was in the, what was that? The Reed parking lot. Yep. Boss just comes up to my car and he goes, what are you doing? It's really hot outside. You shouldn't just be sitting in your car like this. And I just like poured out to him exactly what was going on. And he just made me feel worlds better. And he would text me every day, like a verse or just like a, a message of encouragement to make sure that like I was doing all right, which meant more than anybody could ever understand. And even though Voss and I didn't really know each other, the only reason that I knew Voss was because he lived on First West and Josh Smith used to live on First West. And so that's why I knew who he was. And we kind of had a sense of like a friendship, but not like that deep. Somebody else that helped out a lot was Jeff Wallace. He was the chief of police there. 
uh, Jill Greenway snitched on me that I had been drinking off campus. I had to meet up with him and I had to talk about why I did it and just had to open up about that whole situation. And after that whole conversation was over and, you know, I had to put, I had to be put on like probation for the rest of the year or something. He was like, I'm always here for you. I don't care if you drink or you smoke or whatever. I want you to be okay. And so if you ever need anything, if you ever want to just talk, just message me, like, you know, email me and like, we'll set up a time and we'll hang out. He basically became one of my friends. Like I would just go out of, like, I would literally just go visit his office. Like whenever I just like, didn't feel like I could like make it another day. And he would just encourage me and tell me like verses and just like messages of encouragement of just like, you can do this. And then I told him, I want to leave. I want to leave because I feel like I can't breathe. I want to leave because I feel like I'm stuck in a cage. I want to leave because I don't know who I am anymore. And he was like, you can't leave. And that sucked to hear from somebody that I really looked up to. For him to tell me, he was like, you can't leave because we need you here. We need you here because you are somebody that is out of the box. You are somebody that is unapologetically themselves. You don't fit the Taylor mold. And that's why we need you because too many people are stuck in their ways and you are showing what it means to be uncomfortable. And you're showing what it means to strive for success, even if it means not living by like the Christian standard. And I understood where he was coming from and I understood like why he was saying what he was saying, but it didn't deter me from yep. like yep. leaving because in my heart, I knew that I was not going to get any better by just keeping the same sense of scenery. I knew I needed something different. I was looking at um, Savannah College of Art and Design, which is here in Georgia, or um, Columbia College in Chicago, which obviously is in Chicago, Illinois. Josh Smith, his best friend at the time was Nick Russell. And Nick Russell was going to be going to Columbia as a freshman. And he was like, oh, you need to go to Columbia because they are number 15 in the nation for film. And you would really like thrive there. I think you would absolutely love it. I realized that I was also like not happy in the aspect that I felt stuck behind the camera. And that's why I wanted to be an actress so bad because I was like so jealous of the people that got to be in front of the camera and the people that yeah. got on stage. And I really wanted to be a part of theater and I don't love editing and cinematography just isn't my thing. I love color theory and I love everything that goes into it, but I want to be the actor that gets to be a part of it all. I want to be that like key aspect within the film. At Columbia, they were kind enough to take my gen ed credits and my biblical literature credits and what have you as extracurricular credits and they were able to let me start as a junior the first friend that i made was jerrell nolan oh i love him so much and the way that i met him was through convocation which is basically where they set up tents and they talk about all the clubs that they have and like the you know the club leaders will talk about like why you should join and yada 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 and jerrell was standing by the anime club and I'm standing next to it like, oh, I kind of want to join, but I don't know that much about anime and like, I won't be able to say anything, but I want to learn more. And Jarell literally looks at me and he goes, are you going to join or not? I mean, I don't know. Like, I don't know that much. And he was like, nah, 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 nah. Here's a clipboard. Sign up. And I was like, okay. So Jarell was my first friend that I ever made there. And we're still friends to this day. I absolutely love him. And so I'm taking producing classes and uh, like all these like film credits and then the one class that I got to choose was acting for the non-major. So I'm taking it with Brian Shaw and it's my favorite class. I love going in. I love just like being myself. I love doing the yes and exercises, uh -huh. just being able to be with a group of people that all have the same passion that I do, but they just can't do it. And I remember Brian Shaw pulls me out uh, outside of class one day and he goes, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> my eyes get so wide because mind you, Remember, I've been going to Christian school since I was in kindergarten. I have never, ever heard a professor ever say the F word, let alone any curse word. Uh, like whenever some, like you remember um, Kramer, Dr. Kramer? Back yeah, at, yeah, yeah, yeah. He would like say ass and then he'd be like, oh, I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> you know? Like, yeah, right. So for him to say fuck and that say sorry was like, whoa. This is exactly where I need to be. These are my type of people. I stuttered. I was like, uh, uh, what, what are you talking about? 
And he was just like, I see it. And I'm like playing dumb at this point because I know what he's talking about. But I'm just like, what do you what do you mean? What do you see in me? And he was like, Becca, you have a passion for acting. Go for it. How am I supposed to do that? I'm a film major. I'm in my first semester of junior year. If I were to switch now, I would have to basically start all over. It takes like five semesters of acting just to complete like a, um, a bachelor of the arts degree. Mm-hmm. And so then he was like, come to my office after class. And I was like, okay. He allowed me to skip all the fundamental courses for acting and skip right into the major ones so that I would be right on track with every other actor what? that would, had been in the acting degree since freshman year, which is so not fair to them. But <laughs> I literally had a professor that believed in me so much wow. that they allowed me to skip all the credentials that I needed and go, just go straight into the hard level, like hardcore, yeah. badass courses. So this is 2017. Okay. Um, Miles and I had rekindled our friendship over the summer by playing League of Legends. So we literally played every single day. And mind you, I never had stopped liking him. So as we're playing, like, I'm just like really trying to get good just to please him, you know? Like this, that's how much I like this kid. So then we created this friend group that we would all play League of Legends together. And so we're playing all the time and they got close with him because, you know, like we're all playing League of Legends, whatever. I remember I was playing League of Legends, ironically enough, and uh- he walks into the same room that I am in and goes, Star Guardian here to teach and guide, which is a saying in League of Legends. And I'm like, that's Miles' voice. But we're in Chicago, and he's in Ashland, which is six hours away. How is he here? So I look up, and he's there. And I'm literally so baffled and just flabbergasted that, like, my mouth is open, and I stopped playing the game. We lost, needless to say. I was just like... (laughs) Oh, did you lose? Yes, because I couldn't play the game because I was like, (laughs) huh? My crush is here right now? Like, what? We have a blast that weekend. We hang out every single day. We go to parties and we're just talking and whatever. Um, I remember we were at a party one night. I pushed him up against a brick wall. He won't let me forget this because I was drunk. I pushed him up against this brick wall and I go, I like you. And I know you like me because you wouldn't be here if you didn't. And he was like, Becca Hayes, you crazy. <laughs> keep drinking. <laughs> and like push me away. Oh my and I God. was like, what the heck? You know, we keep partying, whatever. And then we start making out. I'm like, what is that? What does that mean? If you don't like me, why are you kissing me? Whatever. The visit comes to a close and I'm taking him back to his car. And then when the train gets to our stop, he looks at me and he goes, I'll text you. And I was like, okay. And then I get a two page long text message of how he was just basically telling me, Okay, yeah, I like you, and here's why. And I was like, I knew it. I called that shit from a mile away. All of October, we were basically in like the talking phase. The end of October, we were like exclusive, but not together. And then we ended up meeting up in Toledo because we had mutual friends in Toledo because it's kind of the halfway point between Chicago and Ashland. We were at a an EDM club. He turns me around because we were like dancing together. He turns me around and he goes, Becca, would you be my girlfriend? I turned back around. I didn't even give him an answer. I just turned back around. <laughs> I was just like, oh my gosh. And so he turned me back around. He's like, so was that a yes? And I was like, yes, that's a yes. Like, oh my gosh. Second semester rolls around. I'm doing acting. I'm doing what I love. So he's in Ashland. I'm in Chicago. And we would come and see each other about like once a month. We went through a lot of rocky shit through the summer because he had the mentality that he was going to die at the age of 21, which is a whole story that is for him to tell and not me. Right. But it really caused me a lot of uh, depression because he was depressed. Like I'm just saying like in general, when you're in a relationship with somebody that is mentally unstable, it causes you to be mentally unstable. If you really truly care about them because you want them to be okay with your whole entire being. So that really messed me up and caused my anxiety to worsen. We were in a relationship all the way up until May of 2019. And, you know, like amidst that, like I'm doing really well in college, everything's going great. And then we realized in March of 2019 that our lives are going in two separate directions because I'm an actress. I'm going to do anything that it takes to become successful. And therefore I knew that I needed to come to Atlanta because Tyler Perry's here. There are a lot of big productions that are here, like the ones for Jumanji and for Bad Boys 3 and what have you. 
And for him, he was an international law and politics major with a minor in religion. And um, his big dream is to become a foreign ambassador, which entails him having to go to law school. So he's going to be stuck in law school for another three years. And here I am wanting to move to Atlanta. So that means an even bigger gap in distance, just being too busy for each other. So we had decided that we were going to break up after I graduated a month before uh, we broke up. Miles's best friend, Barry, calls me and tells me that Miles has been cheating on me for the past three weeks. Why are you telling me such a joke right now? He's like, Becca, I'm not kidding. And I, I literally couldn't believe it because we're literally about to break up in a month. You could yeah, wait a month wait. to do yeah. that. The night prior, Miles had really tipped me over the edge to where I wanted to break up with him anyway because our relationship was super rocky because, you know, with the whole mental health thing and then on top of that, like being so far apart, it was really, really hard. But I, I mean, I wouldn't trade the relationship of the world. I learned so much from it. Uh, I was like in a lobby on, on League of Legends with my friends Hussein and Tino. Uh, Miles joins the lobby and he queues up for the role of support, which is this role that I play. There's five roles in the game. When you go in school and like oh, everybody I... sits where everyone has a seat. Yeah. And then all of a sudden someone just sits in your seat and you're like, dude, that's my seat. Why are you sitting there? There's no official right. seat, but it's like, that's what I do. That's what I'm here for. Yes. So, like, he can play any role, right? So, for him to, like, queue up for support is, like, okay, come on. You know that's the only role that I know how to play. Please play somewhere else. And he's, like, no, 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 no. I really want to practice my support, Ari. But you can, like, you can be my ABC. And I was, like, I don't want to do that, though. And I was here first, and I really want to play support. And so then Hussein and Tino start speaking up. And they're, like, come on, Miles. Like, you're way better at the game. Like, please just go somewhere else. Like, she was, like, here first. Like, Miles literally got so mad with just that had being said that he said, fuck you, fuck you, Tino, fuck you, Hussein. And you know what? Fuck you too, Becca. And then left the, like, group and, like, went to make up his own game. Tino and Hussein are immediately, like, Becca, don't call him. Just let it go. Just let it be. Like, let's just play our game. Because they knew that, like, that literally was going to, like, make me spiral. So I immediately call Miles, and he sends oh, me the boy. voicemail. I call him again, and he goes, what? And I was like, don't you ever dare talk to me or my friends like that. That is never okay. And he was like, you guys are being annoying. And I said, I don't care for being annoying. That's not permissible. That's not something that you do. And he goes, Becca, you know that you're not making any sense right now, right? Now, mind you, let's remember, this kid can be very manipulative. So I know that the only way that I'm going to get out of this conversation is to apologize and hang up. So in my mind, mentally, I decided that I was going to break up with him the next day because I didn't want to have to deal with this stuff anymore because it was really ruining me mentally. So then the next day, I get this new cheating information, as well as having already wanting to have like break up with him. Um, I had a panic attack in between the two classes that I had that day. Um, one of my friends also had just gotten broken up with. So she was like helping me and like, we both just like cried together. And then I get through the next class and literally the whole time, like my mind is just eating away at me, like thinking about all the other women that he must have been sleeping with. And like, so after class ended, I called him and it was like the most lifeless hay that I've ever heard in my life from him. And I was like, how are you? And he was like, um, well, I finally understand why you hate when I don't text you like good morning and wait till like later in the day like he would always text me every single morning to like wish me like good luck in my classes and like like what he did last night didn't mean anything to him right yeah yeah I texted him back and I said I'm good oh by the way I have to talk to you later and I he was like oh what about and I said I'm breaking up with you (laughs) he was like oh were you not like you don't want to wait until like May and I was like no um, but I'm really busy right now. So I'll text you later. He was like, oh, okay, well, please let me know. And then like, I didn't text him back. So when he was saying that he finally understood how I felt, like when he wouldn't reply to me for a really long period of time, when he was upset with me, like I would never do that to him, no matter how upset I was with him, I wouldn't stop talking to him. So to like have him go through me not talking to him for a long extended period of time meant that I was genuinely upset. So um, first and foremost, did you cheat on me? Have you been sleeping with other women? I said, it doesn't matter. I just wanted to see what you would say. Regardless, I'm breaking up with you for how dishonest, how disrespectful, and just went in on his ass. Yeah, yeah. He literally gave me an apology that was like 15 minutes long of everything that he had done wrong. 
he started apologizing for things that he knew he did wrong and got away with. That's how bad it was. And I told him that I was done. And he was yep. like, Becky, please give me a second chance. Like, I, he was like, oh. no, I'm, I'm not staying with you. Right. And so then he was like, no, please give me a second chance. Like I gave you multiple, please just give me one. And I was like, you gave me multiple. What are you talking about? And he was like, remember back at the beginning of the relationship, like when you would always just yell when you didn't get your way, because you know, back when I was growing up, like I said, it was really quiet in the home or we were yelling at each other to try and get our way. And that's just the way that I was raised. I was raised to yell my voice to get a point across. When in reality, you can get your point across with just a smooth tone. And that pisses people off more, way more than you raising your voice ever does. But I was very toxic at the beginning of the relationship because whenever he would upset me, I would just immediately yell at him and bark at him. And nobody wants to listen to somebody that's yelling. He was like, I dealt with that for months. Please give me the chance to make it up to you because I don't want this to be over. And I was like, okay, that's fair. Anytime that I had brought up a problem or something that needed to be fixed with him, he would shut me down and make me feel like I was the one that needed to apologize Mm -hmm. to the point where I was too afraid to bring up problems to him anymore and was able to like tell him off. And I hadn't been able to do that before because I had lost my voice. So he was like, I didn't know that there was a problem because you didn't say that there was a problem. And I was like, I get that, but I'm telling you there's a problem. He's like, right. And so I'm trying to fix it. Please give me a chance to fix it. I was like, okay, I understand that. But what about this whole cheating thing? He's like, I promise I didn't do it. Who told you that? And I was like, I'll figure it out. They had made it up for the sake of trying to gain a friendship back with him, not knowing that him and I were going to be breaking up in a month anyway. You know, I graduate, everything's fine. We start hanging out during the summer and it never really felt like we broke up because our relationship stayed exactly the same. We just didn't have the commitment to eat to each other anymore. But I was so completely committed to him because at this point I'm in love with him. I will do anything for him. Yep. And he moved on so much faster than I did because he was so hurt that I wouldn't believe him over everybody else. And to this day, I still have no idea if he did or did not cheat because he still adamantly says that he never did it for a really long time. It was a huge mental battle for me because I would have nightmares at night that he did. And then I would try and talk about it the next day with other people. And they would tell me to stop talking about it because I was talking about it so much. I was holding it out. And like, it's literally been almost a year now and I still have no idea. Mm -hmm. I've learned to just let it go because it's in the past and we're not together anymore. So if he did, he did. If he didn't, he didn't. Mm-hmm. It doesn't affect me anymore because I, I'm trying to move on. Yeah, in this scenario, like how, how can you best move on or what's, that, what's the right attitude in that, in that situation? Because there's no clear answer. Put your care into something else because it truly doesn't matter at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Because if he did, he's a scumbag, but I won't know. If he didn't, then I would feel absolutely awful for thinking for months that he did. And the way that I learned to just let it go was to start putting my focus on something else. And whenever those ideas would come into my head, I would start thinking positive thoughts and I would just pray because the biggest problem that people have within the mental health realm is focusing on the negative instead of the positive. Steve Francia, he's my acting teacher, teacher back home in Cincinnati. And he told me, you need to congratulate him for his successes in life and congratulate him for where he is now so that you can move on. Because if you're only spreading positivity to others, it will then leak to putting positivity on yourself. But you know, it's different for every individual and especially for every scenario. Not everybody's like situation is like mine. Be in the here and now and just think, what can I do to achieve success today? Your life is the one that you're living right now. And the only thing that you should be comparing it to is your life. So I always want to be better than I was yesterday. And the only way to do that is to frame my mind to think that way. If I'm focusing on, did he cheat or not? What does that have to do with what I'm going through right now? July 4th of 2019, I got a job at the local dentistry near me as the front desk coordinator. I also was working at LA Fitness as like the front desk person. Then I made a really good friend. Her name is Ashley. It's not Ashley, Ashley. She's 28. She has two kids and she has a fiance and she's really lived life. So whenever I would talk about my problems, they looked like nothing compared to her. 
So then I, it really changed my perspective of like, I really need to stop being so sad about what I'm going through and just focus on what I can be doing to change it. You know, like stop being so sad. Billie Eilish is somebody that I really look up to. And she's like, I really wish that when I was 15, I wasn't so sad. And I wish that even now I wasn't so sad. And the way to get out of just being sad all the time is to like find things that make you happy and just like focus on that. Like when you're in it, you don't realize that like you're being, you're the reason that you are that sad. Like, yes, there's like outside factors that are affecting you. But like, if you learn to just like not let them affect you and just be you, (laughs) how quickly things can change is crazy. I'm not going to say the pain is going to be any less. I'm not going to say that the like, road is not going to be as hard to walk down. But if you're just finding your sense of joy from God, ultimately, and keeping him at the center, it's a 180 of how you will feel. And it's okay to be sad. And it's okay to like, go through hard times. But don't let yourself sulk in it for so long that you forget who you are and forget where you're going. And a lot of my pain came from miles and came from not being able to be with him anymore and came from the fact that like I felt like I lost a sense of self from not being able to be with him anymore but the thing is we were still doing the same thing that we'd always done except we didn't have commitment anymore and that hurt for me because it was like I don't know who else you're doing things with I don't know who else you're talking to and he was like why does it matter like why why can't you just be happy for what we have you know he's pushing the gratitude on you like yeah just be grateful that we this is what this is good. This is what we have. Like, just be grateful that we have something. Right. And I, like, I genuinely could not. Then the last time that I saw him was in, um, on November 30th, which was actually Jackie's birth, uh, not birthday, wedding. And I was in it. I was a bridesmaid. It was beautiful. I loved it. And then that night I went to go see him and talk to him about what I was going through and how I felt and what he thought of it. Stop putting me on such a pedestal because I'm just another guy. But like, I'm not that cool. So just let it go. And I was like, oh, you're right. (laughs) New Year's was kind of like, eh, for me. Because like, I didn't have anybody extremely close to be with. Four days later, Miles calls me. And he goes, Becca, I have to tell you something. But I know that you're going through a lot right now. So I want to wait till you're in a better mindset. Why would you wait to tell me something bad when I'm already going through something bad? Just tell me now. And I was like, what, do you like somebody else? And he just goes silent. And I was like, oh, so you like somebody else? And he was like, yeah, I like somebody else. And that's when I really felt heartbreak for the first time. Like literally lost the ability to breathe. Anxiety overcame my whole entire body. It really hit me like a train how much I was still in love with him and hadn't realized it because I hadn't let go. It was just like the sense of reality of like, hey, like he's genuinely moved on and you're still stuck. Look at you. You're such a fool. First love heartbreak is the worst, the worst thing that you ever have to go through. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. And I'm still going through it. Like today, like I'm still going through it. And you know, I'm living life, trying to move on, having dreams about him every single night, anxiety attacks every single morning really just trying to figure out how to get through life. And then the day before I left for Atlanta, I hung out with my friends, Brian Hill, Jarrell Sneed, and their girlfriends. And they have like this like little uh, get together of sorts to send me off, you know, with good wishes and whatnot. And the next day, I think it was February 15th, I traveled from Cincinnati, Ohio to Atlanta, Georgia with my parents. So we came here. Now I'm living here with my grandpa. And my aunt lives 15 minutes away from here. So my cousins are around me and my aunt, my uncle and my grandpa are here. And then, so I'm like trying to delve into the, into the industry, trying to make it happen, really struggling to make friends. And then on March 26th at 10 45 PM. You're really good with dates and times here. Yeah, I know. It's weird. Um, this was March 27th. I get a call from my friend Cameron Antoine and he is a, a friend from high school. And he sounds lifeless. And he goes, did you hear? It's like, did I hear what? And then he was like, hold on. And he puts me on hold for a second. This kid doesn't call me, you know, like at random. Like, well, Snapchat, but he doesn't call me. So like, something must be wrong. Brian died to a brain aneurysm last night. I literally started laughing because I thought he was kidding. Mm -hmm. 
I was like, oh, haha, ha, when? <laughs> and then he was like, no, seriously. And I just started bawling because like I said, he was one of my best friends from my core friend group in high school. All my friends start calling me and we're all just crying together. And especially during quarantine, nobody can come see each other, hug each other, be there for each other. I was just talking to him three days prior. Yeah, that's, that shit really gets me every time. Just like I was just talking with them or I just saw them. And it's so funny because three days prior, I was talking to Brian and he was, he was living in New York and he goes, you better make some connections for me because he was, uh, so he had just done a documentary on the opioid epidemic in Ohio. So we're literally talking about our dreams and then he's gone. The funeral was on Saturday that, or April 4th. They did a live stream of it because I wasn't able to go. If I had gone, it was in Ohio. If I came back here, I already have a job here. I would have had to be on quarantine for 14 days just to make sure that I didn't have the virus. So I wasn't able to go and I wasn't able to get my sense of peace. I wasn't able to be with my friends and say goodbye to somebody that meant so much to me. And that sucks. You know, dealing with that on top of heartbreak and on top of trying to discover how I'm gonna make it in this industry has been so, so hard. Amidst all of this, I still have joy because I have God and I have Jesus at the center of my life. I would say that where I am now is worlds better than where I was in 2017. And that's incredible to look at. And so, yeah, I've been crying. Yeah, I've been sad, but I'm allowed to be sad. My best friend just died. (laughs) I'm really just trying to like take each day as it comes, be thankful for what I have, and not let myself give up because I can see such a beautiful future for myself. And I know that I can be successful if I put my mind to it. I'm excited to see where I end up. Me too. (laughs) Thank you. If you have mental health issues and you're dating somebody who doesn't, what advice would that be? And then what advice if you both do? I think for people that it's imbalanced, it's hard to understand where the other person is coming from. And so I would say that it's okay that you cannot empathize, but be willing to sympathize. And if you don't know the difference between the two, empathy is when you've already gone through the same thing that the other person is going through. And sympathy is when you haven't gone through it, but being willing to hear and listen and understand. Don't judge them for what they're going through, but just let them know that you care and that you're there but also do not let their struggle become your struggle because it is not your burden to carry. You can help, but you cannot carry it for them. If they are not willing to accept help, you cannot help somebody that does not want to be helped. And I learned that the hard way. If you're trying to help somebody that doesn't want to be helped, you're literally just hurting yourself in the process. For people that both have issues, I would say that I don't, believe that a relationship is right for you at that point in time. Mental health in the sense of if it's something that you're just ignoring and not willing to fix, then you shouldn't be in a relationship until you've conquered that. But if you're dealing with mental health, that's like, you know, something that you take medication for or something that has always been there, it's different. Um, I would say, you know, in the same regard, just be understanding, be willing to help, be willing to listen but don't belittle them and don't make them feel like they are wrong for having to go through what they are. Don't take what they're going through on yourself because you're already going through enough. If I feel like I'm trapped in a box of sorts, kind of like you were, and I really want to get to know, I feel like there's this other me that's out there. I just, I don't feel like myself. What advice would you give to that person who has maybe those things that like to explore, like to find out, oh man, I'm actually into anime or I'm actually into EDM and going to concerts but like maybe I'm scared to learn more about myself or go before you're ready that's an acting term that's like um something that we always say before we're going on stage or before we're going into a scene because you're never going to be ready you can prepare for as much as you want but you're going to over prepare or under prepare it doesn't matter just go before you're ready because that's the best time to go incredibly scary to go into the unknown to go into the sense of uncomfortability to step outside of your comfort zone, but there's so much beauty beyond it that you can't see from standing where you are. You know, everybody's afraid to fail. Everybody's afraid that they're not gonna look good in the public eye. Everybody's afraid that they're just not gonna be good enough. 
well, how do you know that you're not good enough or that you can't succeed at it if you don't try? You know, the best way to get to succeeding in something is to fail multiple times. If you're afraid to like start your new job or if you're afraid to move to a different place, you just have to conquer that fear by changing your frame of mind from being that of, well, I'll never be good enough to I am and will be good enough. All right, I want to wrap up here. I've got a final five that you gotta, we got to get through together. Uh, what are your thoughts on TikTok? Well, the whole thing about, you know, China, like, taking all your information is really scary to me. I just found that out. That's nuts. So I don't like that. But also, um, I think it's for the younger generation specifically, but I, I don't mind other people doing it. A lot of people have been telling me that I should do it because yeah. I'm such a lively, like, personality and fun to listen to. Yeah. It's just like another platform that I would have to delve into and I just don't really see myself getting into it, but maybe I will. Maybe it's a lie and you know, like I'll download it tomorrow. Like we'll see. <laughs> what is the best thing to do during the coronavirus? Don't lose your sense of self. Don't be so caught up on the fact of how scary it is and how the news is portraying it. And just remember to like keep doing what you love. And it's even a great time to like learn something new, you know, whether that be scrapbooking or learning a new language or um, finding a good book, you know, like just something. What's your favorite anime or one you would recommend? Uh, see, I'm still not incredibly into anime. The first one that I ever watched was called Fruits Basket. It's amazing. If you haven't seen it, you should. Oh, I haven't seen that one. Fruit, Fruits Basket? Mm-hmm. Um, it's about the uh, Zodiac, in a sense. Well, what? <laughs> no way, like the Zodiac Killer or like Zodiac is in like science and stuff? No, the zodiac signs, like the twelve zodiac signs. Well, oh, I guess okay. it's thirteen technically. But the one that I've recently been watching, it's called. Uh, I don't know why I'm saying it's called because you probably know My Hero Academia. Yeah, baby, woo, love that mm-hmm. one. And I really want to get into um, what is it, Dragon Slayer? I think. Okay, I haven't seen that one. Um, and there's also one called Black Clover. I want to see that one too. Number four. What is your favorite part about yourself? My ability to create conversation and keep the ball rolling no matter what. <laughs> Number five, the last one. What is your proudest moment? I guess when I had the courage to, um, back at Taylor, do the vagina monologues, because like that's already a sensitive topic within it, mm-hmm. within itself. But being able to like delve into acting with such courage because I'd never done it before and just be like, yeah, this is going to be my thing. I'm going to do it. And then like mm-hmm. accomplishing that was like really cool. All right, let's do this. I want you to pick a person, uh, whoever you want that exists, but you're shouting them out. Take as long as you want. Um, shout out Janice from eighth grade for getting me into, you know, acting, whatever you want. But uh, take some time and just shout somebody out. I would definitely have to shout out Brian Hill. That dude was going to live a legacy. We all believe that he was an angel on this earth, and that's why he was gone so quickly. He only lived 23 years of life. But the 23 years that he was here, he touched so many lives. And we believe that he was a bestseller of a book. Our God says that he is our creator. He is our, you know, the beginning and our finisher. And at the end of his life, you know, his book was stamped as a bestseller. And it doesn't take God that long to write a bestseller. (laughs) Um, He was an impact player in the sense that he played football. And so they're, you know, they literally have the word impact players for those that impact the game enough to win or lose. And he really was an impact player in life. I miss him roasting me all the time. I miss him calling me at two in the morning just to FaceTime. And I absolutely love him. And legitimately, when I get my first Oscar, because that will happen, I am giving the first shout out to Brian. Thanks so much, Becca. Um, yeah, like you're an integral part of my story, um, just kind of a turning point with why I actually started this in the whole first place back five years ago. And, um, you know, you mean a lot to me and, you know, I see a lot of potential and it's really cool to see that you're kind of going forward or, uh, you know, what you believe in. You're more so yourself than you were five years ago. You are um, an amazing person and uh, I can't wait to see you on the Oscars stage at some point. Thank you. Yeah. Bye, guys. (laughs) Oh, bye. Hey everybody, this is Ryan from the Classic Buffalo Podcast. Wanted to take a second to talk about Anchor, how I'm actually 
making this podcast happen. Super happy that I'm partnering with them. So Anchor is actually the easiest way to make a podcast. I've done my research. This is basically the best way. I promise it's going to give you everything you need in one place for free, which is the best part. It's going to have tools, so you don't really need a fancy schmancy recording guy. Anchor's going to be helping you out there, and then they're going to distribute the podcast everywhere to Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google, everything. And then you can also make money with basically no minimum listenership, which is kind of rare. So hop on Anchor as soon as you can. Thanks. And that's the end of the episode. Thank you so much for listening this week to the Classic Buffalo Podcast. If you would like to be on an episode, please feel free to reach out over Instagram at Classic Buffalo, where we can talk about anything from super shallow, uh, random stuff, you know, birds and dogs and sports and whatever, whatever's important to you. Or we can get super deep and talk about some of the most difficult things or just things that you went through, things that you've learned in life, things you want to do. You know, we're here to talk about the past, present, and future. So uh, now we're into the debrief portion where, you know, I kind of give my thoughts on the guest, my thoughts on just what's going on in general in life. So I had a couple things to say, you know, um, Becca had so much to fit into, you know, all of this time and, you know, she did a really good job. And a lot of her story came mostly after, you know, she left Taylor and, you know, I was, let's, let me think, I was like a junior or senior when I met her. And so I was pretty much gone and she was still there. Um, and I remember, you know, coming back, uh, cause I graduated in 2016 and then like I was on and off coming back to the university. Uh, you know, when I was, I came back to, I was at Florida at that point, I graduated and went down to Florida and then, um, I would be coming back for, uh, Erica, my best friend's wedding and I would be coming back for my birthday. And so I remember coming back and seeing my old room at Taylor and seeing Becca at a football game. And, you know, she was still there. Like all my friends were still at Taylor and, you know, I was graduated and it was just kind of weird. It was kind of cool to see her again. But, uh, Becca has a really special, uh, part in my story. And, uh, we, we kind of just faded away uh, you know, as far as just kind of how things went, she got really busy and she moved away. And, you know, that, that happens a lot with family and friends where you're just, you, if one of you moves, it just becomes a little bit harder to stay in touch. And that kind of happened with me and Becca. And, uh, you know, a lot of this, some of the stuff I just didn't even know, like it was just hearing it as it was happening because we just haven't talked in a while. But, you know, while Becca was at Taylor, she had a really big impact. And I, I honestly can thank her for, um, being there in one of the toughest moments of my entire life. Um, we were hanging out and, uh, I was having difficulty with my mom and just, uh, just having fights or I just, I was, I was either not talking to her at the time or something was going on with me and my mom. It was a rough patch and Becca had come over and like we, I was walking her back to her dorm and, uh, it was like, I was just, moody and I just was not I was just out of it and I think she might have been just like you know Becca after listening to this episode you would figure that you know she was blunt and say like what's wrong like what's going on and I just was like leave me like I just need you to leave like leave like everyone else does and I just the second I said that it just streams of tears going down my face and I was like several feet from Becca because there was like a point where I didn't have to walk her all the way to her dorm you know I was just kind of being polite and whatever being a friendly guy but uh and you know it's like a Friday or Saturday night so people were walking around campus and I'm like crying in the middle of this thing and I just I was so depressed and I was so um just in a bad mind space and I I didn't want to be here anymore and I think Becca knew something was wrong. And she kind of like, I, I, one of us walked closer to each other. And it was just, she just kind of was like, I can't let you be alone because I don't trust that you're going to be okay. And she sat with me in the chapel, like this one of these rooms f- till three in the morning, just sitting across from me. And I was just sitting there crying or I was trying to like say stuff or whatever. And she just was sitting there just being present 
And I think I might have been off my medication at that point and wasn't thinking clearly, but um, Becca was there. And I said, okay, I think it's like it's three in the morning now or whatever it was, like super late. And I was like, I think it's okay. I have to go back to my dorm now. And she's like, are you going to be okay? And I was like, I think so. And I cried myself to sleep. And that was the first time that never happened. And the next day, I talked with my dorm person, the, whoever the head of the dorm is, and I was like, I don't feel safe. Um, I need to go home. I need to, like, and I talked with my doctor, and, like, my dad was really concerned, and, like, it just was, I just didn't feel safe anymore. And I remember just walking around that next day, like, being so upset at other people having fun and so upset at all of my friends and them just, I was like being a douche at that one point to some people I remember specifically, but I just didn't care. And I was like, you have, you guys, in my mind, I'm like, you guys have no idea. Like I, I want to take my own life right now. And you just, you don't even care. Like you don't even notice me being sad right now. And I just, I just was in a really bad place, but it was people like Becca that saved my life. And I'm forever grateful for someone who just took the time to say, like, maybe I'm going to get less hours of sleep the next day or I can sleep in. But it's worth keeping my friend alive, you know. And I'm just forever grateful for her. And it was because of that I went home. I got new medicine. And that's when I started Classic Buffalo. That's when I started this. And she's a big reason why. You know, she kept me alive enough to get go home, get more meds, get different meds. And I asked myself the question, what if I succeed? And that's when I started Classic Buffalo. And then all of these amazing things happen over the next two months of that. And when I pitched it at Taylor's Shark Tank, um, I made her a pitch of a part of my pitch because I wanted to thank her for pretty much saving my life. And she's going to forever have a part of my story, you know, as someone who was there at one of my worst moments. And so, um, you know, I hope you guys can find someone like that. You know, some of us are more lucky than others. Um, but it's just, if you ever think that a moment like that's going to go unnoticed or being nice to someone, being supportive for people, that that's just going to not matter, it will. Just the little things. So thank you so much, Becca, for just being you. And um, it's just, it's so cool to see someone who um, is still going through it, but is also just like fighting for her dream, you know, to, to become an actress. And she's always been boisterous, always been blunt, always been like someone who's very unique. And like, I love that about her. And just, she's trying to always find the way to be herself. And, you know, it's a lot of people have heard her as well. And that sucks, <laughs> you know. It's not, I wouldn't wish that on anybody for anyone to be, feel like they can't be themselves or to be trapped in a box, you know? So, you know, I, I think I can, Becca would agree with me and say that, like, if you feel like you're in a box, get the hell out of the box, <laughs> you know, fight for it. It may not be easy, but like, it's worth it. Like, you got to let your freak flag fly, you know, like, got to find it out. Go search for yourself because yourself is beautiful. And, um, yeah. This past weekend was, uh, you know, we're getting closer to reopening the economy or whatever. I know Indiana, like, these next couple of weeks are slowly opening up and stuff. And I think, I, I don't know, we'll see. I might be back into the office and working by the end of the month here. But, uh, you know, obviously still being cautious. And uh, But this past weekend was just really tough. Like, it was the la one time in a very long time where I just was like, I don't want to get out of bed. I can't, like, and I just, I know I wasn't, it wasn't like it was like 4, 5, 6 p.m. at this point, but it was still was just like, I really just don't want to get out of bed. I really just don't. And I was just really sad and not in a good place, but, you know, I got out. <laughs> it's one of those things where I was like, okay, maybe if I rock my body in my bed and maybe get like my limb hanging off, maybe that'll get momentum for me getting out or, oh, I need to eat. You know, it's 2 p.m. Like, let's let's go, you know. And I got some stuff done. But, um, 
obviously if you're hearing this right now I'm still alive so (laughs) which is good and um you know there's a lot of other cool things going on but you know I'm still trying to find me I'm still trying to find a way to monetize this you know full time figure out what my passions are figure out you know how to be fully me you know because I still feel like there's part of me that's not being found or lived in I don't know there's another part of me but I'm working on it just like you are on your own things so keep fighting guys one day at a time one week at a time one month and you know just gotta keep going as I said, I think I said it last week, was uh, I want to see what happens if I don't give up. You know, let's see what happens. Well, that's all I got. Hopefully you were able to get some things either from what I just said or from what Becca said. Maybe you were able to relate or maybe you were able to learn. Uh, let me know. And once again, if you'd like to be on the podcast, it's just as simple as a DM away. So let me know. Um, but we'll talk soon, probably next week. So... Have a good one, guys. Bye.